going to be a great segment. I'm glad you're here. We have a wonderful panel, and I want to make sure we leave the time to hear their perspective. We're going to talk primarily about what's happening with disruption and transformation in the industry right now. And the angle I want to take on this is look at it from the perspective of talent, agent, and actual content producer. We have three wonderful individuals. So with that, let me start to introduce the panel so we can get into this if I could. In the, in the I guess I've been working professionally about 18 years, and the the, the shift is enormous. I think uh, there's there's many things, but one obviously you know the, the big one is is we just don't from an artist perspective we, we don't make that mid that mid range film anymore. There, there's no more twenty to sixty million dollar films that are being made inside of the studio system, right? So that kind of it's the studio system just isn't really supporting those kinds of films anymore. Yeah. When I started, if I would have ended up in a commercial, a commer like, like an AT&T commercial, it would have been like the kiss of death for an actor. You know, it would be like, oh, I'm just so happy about it. Like, now, or a professional yeah, yeah, now, now, what I think it's to say. <laughs> <laughs> been selling product as an actor, we wouldn't be hired as an actor. The studio, it was, it was sort of like not happening. You, would, you just never saw it. And, and then nowadays, you know, it's it's really kind of become the, the actor or the movie star sort of has their hands in, you know, a lot of different places now, not just sort of the, the man behind the curtain. It's it was a lot more mysterious. Yeah, it was just a you know campaign for you know a product that you wouldn't necessarily uh, think, and so the fact that there have been so many firsts means that now there's just the, I think the whole universe is open to it, which is exciting because if you're talent right now, there are so many different places for people to to see it and uh, and so many different avenues and, and ways to express it. I mean, as a personal aside, I'm excited about the advent of social media because it now allows me to track Kate Hudson. Um, you know, uh, previously, I would need to get her on the phone with the director, or there'd be an important job at stake, and I'd be calling frantically, I couldn't reach her, and now I'll just open Snapchat. Yes, now I look on Snapchat, <laughs> and I see that she's in her living room singing with her son, Ryder. I'll call the house, and I'll say, I need to talk to Kate, and she's very busy right now. I'm like, I know that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm thankful for Snapchat. You know, when I decided to get onto social media, which I actually came on really late, so. Um, but when I decided to do that, I never wanted anyone else in charge of what goes out to me on my social media channels. I wanted to be in control of that. Just because, to me, as, as my business grows, as the brand kind of grows, it's really important that it's authentic. Um, it means a lot more work. For me, you know, because at, at some points, you know, you, you you know your your social media channel does become a platform for you to uh, get product out there and share that with your consumer when you have a business. Um, but to me, it's all about authenticity. It's all about uh, you know yeah. being. <laughs> and uh, I I like it because you know you know it, it's sort of. I, like I said before, it's my own narrative, and um, it also is a barometer for myself. You know, when it comes to, you know, when you become a, a celebrity or someone that people come to to sell a product, um, you know, it's sort of for me. I'm like, would I want to put that out there? You know, if it doesn't, it doesn't matter how much money goes behind that for me personally. Um, it has to be something I believe in. So, and I. And with the success of my company with Fabletics, I, I actually think that just me being honest with myself and with my fans, that it does translate to people recognizing that your business is an authentic business, that you care about it, um, that it's something that you believe in. Um, and, 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 you know, it's, it's funny because they say they can't, they, a lot of times you say, they say, like, nobody can really tell or they haven't had any real data that says that your that social media actually pushes films or actually pushes product you know they kind of say like they, they, they can't really decipher what that is um, 
But in my experience, I find that it 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 does it actually when it's authentic, it does. You know, you can tell. I mean, at this point, I, I don't think you can ever fool anyone at this point. We're all so connected. You know, when someone comes out and it's like, you know, they're like holding, you know, like the day's potato chips. Like, you know it's an ad. You know what I mean? So Kate eats the day's potato chips all so I, I do think that I do think that the more authentic your social is, the more that people really actually kind of are engaged in the, your your social media. And I think engagement is 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 way more important uh, than actual numbers. In, in a in a sense that I mean I, I do think you get a sense from Kate of just as she was saying authenticity. I mean you have a real idea of what her home life is like, and you know about her relationship with her kids, and you know about her love of singing and. Uh, and she's just like, you know, uh, you know, that's why often uh, she's referred to you know, as America's sweetheart. You sort of feel like you know Kate. Um, uh, but I think that's real. I mean, like, you know, like that's that's Kate's home life. And it's, you know, translated to uh, her ability to, you know, be a best-selling author. And, uh, you know, while we aren't necessarily, we can't talk about it here, a director recently saw her. Uh, singing on Instagram, and that led to an opportunity. And so there are a lot of really cool things that happen uh, as a result. You know, look, I, I think the downside of the negatives, uh, without listing specific clients or actors, I mean, well, the, I just, I mean, the danger, You're juicy, I, even. No, I think, look, the danger that you can get into is that just now with you know with, with Twitter and, and social media and uh, and a 24-hour news cycle, you know, it's it's, it's dangerous because. You sort of get lulled into this sense of security, and you say one thing which you don't mean to say, or it's a joke that you think no one is going to see. And within 15 minutes, I mean, you can be. If you, know, you have millions of followers, you know everybody's going to see it. I, I'm not even saying if you necessarily <laughs> post it yourself. I'm just, if you like get caught saying something you shouldn't have said, I mean, it's you know, it, it, you're dealing with a crisis like you cannot imagine. Where ten years ago you might have got away with it a little bit. So your days are a little less predictable now. Yeah, so just yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I work for a big media company, right? So all these technology companies came knocking, uh, and us big fat media companies uh, uh, told them to go away, stop stealing our stuff, don't put any of it on there, right? And then they amassed a huge audiences, and then we we begged them to put it on, right? And, um, <laughs> And so initially, you know, my boss would say, well, you just go build your own social network. Go, you know, figure it out. And um, except I didn't know how to, but we tried, right? Uh, and then, you know, the late 2000s, um, I'm minding my own business in a production truck. We, we asked Taylor Swift kindly to cross over the top on the Video Music Awards, which she graciously agreed to do. Uh, and then she won an award and Kanye wasn't as gracious in his feelings about mm. the winning that award. So he, <laughs> right, so, so he interrupted her. And, uh, you know, we had to deal with some crying artists. But then, you know, as soon as I got back, my phone just lit up. And Oprah called uh, Taylor, and um, it went insane. And so essentially, we said, it's, all the rules are changing. It's going to be a fire hose. And similarly, when we did Jersey Shore, um, we accidentally leaked some footage um, that went out there and, and, and on the show as well. And so it, it, it can be a fire hose. Again, it's not personal for us. Um, in terms of sourcing talent, um, it's still great. I mean, you know, the way in the early days of MTV, those sort of creative freaks were, you know, Michael Bay and Spike Jones and Mike Judge who lived in a basement drawing comics. And now it's the people who do Kung Fury or the people just surfing the internet. They live out there and the next Tim Burton will come from there. It's just much more diffuse. Trying to stay so relevant all the time, so fast, get it out there, get it out, you know, from a production point of view, at least in my in my experience. That there's the risk taking on young artists in a in a in a place where people really want to bet on them. Not saying like, you know, a young artist needs to go out there and like lost their ass these days. And they could go out and get like, you know, all of a sudden they have a YouTube channel and next thing you know, people are like, Well great, they've got about ten million. Like, really, is that your promo? Like, what how 
you know what, there are still kids that are like Mike Judge doing comics in a basement that I think they're hopefully, we're sort of in this like very combustible time of technology, but they're still, as I raise my teenage son, all these kids who really actually want are like, you know, super cre creative kids that I think for some reason think they need to be relevant in order to get, you know, I think what I'm trying to say is that artistry is not look, looked upon as it used to be, and you would know because you were an MTV at a time that was actually like, kind of like you know, awesome before it, you know, started. You know, is that we, you know, so the artist is actually a, a little bit at this moment in, the, in, the, in, in creating content is a lot more disposable today than it was 15 years ago. You know, we're not creating the movie stars anymore. You know, there's a lot of talent out there, but we're not, you know, we're, we're it's, it's kind of more about, I think, what what's the next big thing instead of sort of, making the best version of that content. Yeah. And the movies that I could be doing are just movies I don't really want to be doing right now. And that means that, you know, like the big sort of comedy is actually, as much as if it was the right one, I'd want to do it, but I, I just, I don't know. Artistically, as I get older, I, I want to be doing different things. Business-wise, I want to be. It's, to me, that that's very that's that's actually quite different, you know. And I I believe that the social presence and the work that I've done in my career, you know, all of it. It doesn't matter. I mean, I could be in like a horror film, and just the fact that if you're looking at like numbers or points of interest or household names or the relevance of a name, like I don't think it matters. Like horror films, all of it. Like I don't think that it needs to be on brand for me to be making films in order for me to be passionate about active work. Um, so I actually look at, I actually do compartmentalize them, you know, I mean, um, and I guess maybe that's because storytelling will always come first for me. So, um, you know, I would, I would do anything to do a, a part that I'm passionate about, uh, even if it goes against my moral, my, my own personal moral and ethical Codes in life, you know. It was, you know, studios and networks that were really bearing the risk of a project and uh, guaranteeing uh, money to talent. And now uh, it's really shifted where um, studios and uh, media companies are asking the talent to share that risk with them. You know, um, in the best case scenarios, that can be unbelievably lucrative for talent. Uh, and then obviously, if something doesn't work, it, it, it can fail. Um, you know, that said, you know, CAA has really been at the forefront and not reactive at all to these changes. I mean, you know, between we packaged 11 of the first 12 shows for Netflix and we're working with Apple on, uh, you know, their new original content. So we've been very much at the forefront of, of really building these new distribution channels. And that, I think, is an exciting thing for talent because, frankly, there are just more places that are making, uh, making these things that, that audiences want to see, so I think everyone really wins in that regard. Um, and then, you know, when it works out, people can make a lot of money. Is it easier or? But probably more challenging. Uh, more challenging, but more exciting, I think. And I, it's one of the reasons that I think that uh, the content is, it, you could argue, is getting better. I mean, there isn't, you know, as Van was saying earlier, there isn't that, you know, we don't have to hold to a 30 minute or one hour narrative anymore. So the fact that uh, limited series exists, or you know, someone can go and do you know three episodes or four episodes, or you know a four you know a series of three minute clips that just didn't exist before. So it just and, yeah. And as an actor, that's like so exciting, especially like just going from film to be able to go and do television and exist as a character for that long is like a dream. Uh, yeah. Sorry. So no, yeah, exactly that. I think a lot of opportunity. Like to say, uh, it seemed to me like there was a content renaissance happening. Uh, there was great content, it was just all over the map. And um, technology just disrupted the business I had grown up in. 
you know, I managed 15 linear TV networks and they were probably 70, 80% repeats. Why would a kid watch a repeat when they can get on demand whenever they want, whenever they want it? And, and the business dictated that uh, as the ratings declined, you put more commercials into the show. So uh, we were always a consumer facing business and the consumer was just going other places. They watched music videos on YouTube and it felt like that's where all the great young creative energy was happening. Uh, the problem with the shop I was working at, like a lot of big media companies, I would say, I want to create new brands, I want to put all this stuff up on YouTube, and they'd say, um, where's the cash money? And, um, you know, there was no short-term return, but, but our business has shown where the eyeballs go, the money follows. And I think having the ability, uh, it, it's a great opportunity. The outcome's unknown, the length is unknown. You know, uh, oddly enough, uh, though my PR people wouldn't let me call this, but before um, the lyric to the song Gunpowder in the Sky hit me, uh, the name of the studio was STD. <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine why they would allow that? Uh, but it was surprised you needed their advice. <laughs> <laughs> but we didn't get ratings. We didn't get ratings till the end of the quarter, so we had no idea. Mm. Now the data is so much more acute. I know who watches every short, where they're watching, all their demographics, and um, you know it doesn't change your gut and what you decide to make. But um, we just hired the head of audience insights uh, and data from YouTube, and uh, again he told us where to put all these smoking weed with nuns, the specific sites that would that would drive movie theater attendance in Los Angeles and New York. And so that has really changed the dynamic of the people in the room. So you're more oriented toward folks who bring the data and analytics into the business? Definitely, I, I mean, that's a problem, but I'd like to meet the freak who created ways. You know, that, that person told me when I was gonna get here today, right? I think that's pretty incredible. I have no idea how that works. But, so I don't think that helps my business, so it would make me on time for meetings. Have <laughs> <laughs> you ever cared about that? No, I never did. I never wore a watch. I think so. Now I can. So, so Michael, let's hear from you. What's changed in terms of how you're building your networks and your line of work, and what's different about it right now? What do you think about it? Uh, I, look, I think there's been a, an amazing blend of Silicon Valley and Hollywood that traditionally did not exist. Um, so, uh, you know, the relationship between the two is uh, probably closer than it's ever been. And if you had gone to anyone, you know, 10 or 12 years ago and said that they'd be watching television on Amazon or getting new network, you know, or new TV shows or content, uh, they wouldn't have necessarily believed it. So, um, you know, and then obviously uh, you're finding, you know, I think the two worlds are just really fascinated by one another. So a lot of the times, uh, you know, Kate and I will, you know, end up at like random, like, you know, having game nights with Evan Spiegel and, you know, uh, and Travis Kalanick. I mean, it will just be, you know, really interesting mix of, uh, of people both from Silicon Valley and here. Um, and then obviously investment opportunities that a lot of actors and talent are taking part in. Yeah, and content, especially yeah. people like Snapchat and, um, yeah, I, yeah. So if you, if Sounds like uh, discretionary capital of your time, allocating your time. You're gearing toward the nexus of technology as being maybe one of the places where you're putting that discretionary time. For sure. If you had to pick an individual you could spend an hour with, who would it be? Uh, look, I mean, it, it would probably be Bob Iger or Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, Bob Iger, because I'd like him to be president in a few years. And, uh, and Mark Zuckerberg, who I just think is, you know, at the forefront of connecting the world, and he'll be doing interesting things in content space as well, which I think, uh, uh, you know, talent will benefit from. Okay, how about you? Honestly, I have been thrust into the world of business in the last three and a half years. I absolutely love it. It's very different than the movie industry. Um, and the learning curve has been huge. So for me, it's really, uh, I guess the, it's, it's really learning about how to shape business. Shape, shape, shape. There you go. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and creating relationships that are helpful to me, not, not in 
transaction, but in information and, and learning more. Um, I really love it. And I think that uh, instead of, as we were talking about sort of backstage, like chasing the buck, actually like spreading the message. And hopefully within that, there's obviously success or less success in brands. But that, that to me, I think um, is where my change has happened. You know, I'm, I'm you know, in, investing more in my life, understanding investing. These are things that, you know, as a little dramatic actress, you know, I was thinking that I would be doing in my in my 30s, uh, but very quickly, it's just the world that I'm immersed in and I'm, I'm very much enjoying it. So that's where that is. And I think if I was to sm spend an hour with someone. Warren Buffett, I would assume, based on what you said. Probably Warren Buffett. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I hope that you do make that, that happen. Uh, yeah. 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 Warren would be very happy yeah. to spend an hour with you. Warren or Warren Buffett. Yeah. That's a good sign. I just, I just like, I don't know. I, for me, I just want to connect more to people and figure out how I can talk about things, other people's lives, and how to make them just happier. So, uh, so Steve. Marshall with Chadwick Boseman and Josh Gad and Sterling Brown, they who just got nominated for an Emmy, which is really exciting, and um, and Dan Stevens, and and we had the best time when we made a film about Thurgood Marshall, sort of from the perspective of one trial, um, and uh, a very definitive trial in, in his in his youth, and um, and the movie turned out really really wonderful, and um, that comes out in October, and then I'm working on a movie right now that I can talk about, which is you know. So because like I want to talk about it so much. Uh, yeah, I love it. I love. It. I'm having one of the best experiences of my life right now. So I feel really lucky. It's the best because because the people that I'm working with and um, and being able to take different things that I've done throughout my life and actually use them for the first time in a in a really in a real way. And because you have so much time on your hand, you decided to take a second run at writing a book, and you've got. You know, oh yeah, that's right. I've got my my new book coming out. Yeah, I've got another is, book called Pretty Fun. And it's different from the first. And it's different from the first. So it's like an ongoing. You know, hopefully I'll do all kinds of them. Uh, but this one is pretty happy, and then this one's pretty fun, and it's all about just how we connect, connecting, having a good time. Um, how we do that. Uh, it's good, Dan, you've got some stuff. I'm on a series of books, um, we start shooting in a month. Uh, the first one's called Eat Brains Love. Mm -hmm. And it's a uh, zombie <laughs> comedy. Uh, uh, That's awesome. Uh, it's in high school turning into zombies. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the sequel is called Undead with Benefits. So uh, <laughs> we're not shooting that yet, but I'm sure we will. Um, we've got uh, something called Kaleidoscopes. Um, we have a comedian and a guest in each episode um, look into kaleidoscopes and they review the kaleidoscopes in an altered state and they talk about why. <laughs> <laughs> the kaleidoscopes are coming back. I don't know if you guys heard that. That sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah, Is that weed or mushrooms? Uh, <laughs> what she meant to say, what she meant to say. <laughs> what are they taking? <laughs> Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. In my work, everything is going to be okay in 2018. What's the the one thing that you are just kind of most focused on, concerned about, thinking about? And if if this transpired over the next 18 months, everything's going to be okay in 2018. Michael, what would you say? Okay, it's not my work life. I want the Democrats to take back the House in 2018. <laughs> 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 Becomes my problem. What I meant to say. Uh, you know, I gotta do like the typical mother thing. I just want my kids to like. I got a teenager. You know what I mean? Like, I just want that to be. Cool. <laughs> That's a big ass. Yeah. You know what I mean? I just. I just, Let's hear I'm, real, just huh? I'm just so scared <laughs> for these so. next year. Uh, no, but it just, you know, selfishly, um, 
I would say that uh, that this project I'm working on is everything that we all hope that the secret project. the secret will be, and um, and that um, and that uh, uh, and that I yeah, that's it. I I really I'm I'm just I'm cr I'm craving more creative work right now, and I you know if I can get a couple of my own songs to just like done. Even if I don't put them out, I think everything will be okay internally. Good. Yeah, how about you? Um, I guess if, if I can figure out a way to get eyeballs to see the project over the weekend, it, it will break my heart uh, to make great stuff and people don't see it because it lives on a small platform. Um, and I really also hope they keep making the black bird. Because my fat friend is If you have any influence on whoever makes that, I think I have a couple in my closet or something. That I can help you with. Well, folks, you know, you've been incredibly gracious with your time to join us today. Really good insights. We really appreciate your support here. And I'd like you all to show your appreciation. For